Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar. Again, I want to introduce myself. This is Jonathan Ruthier. I'm the executive director for CSNI. And uh, I'm here today with two guests, um, Ann Butenhoff and Judith Bombster from Butenhoff and Bombster uh, Law Firm in Manchester. We're really excited today to um, provide you with some educational content, whether you are uh, somebody receiving services, a family member, a support person, or someone else working in the field. We're hopeful that we can uh, provide you with some helpful information today regarding planning for uh, somebody's future. Uh, I know that other folks will probably be, be joining in after we start, and so I'll pop back in in a few minutes to go over a little bit of this information again. But just to help you all um, as we get started, I wanted to just say a few things about the webinar application that we're using today. So this is a Zoom webinar, and I'm just gonna point out a couple of features. First, um, when you signed in, you were automatically muted on your microphone, and that is so that we can keep the background noise to a minimum. But we do have some features here that will help you uh, be able to submit questions if you have questions during the presentation today. Our intention is to hold all the questions until the end of the webinar and then time permitting, we will answer them all. <clears throat> and if you have a question, uh, all you have to do really is to hover your mouse of your computer down over your at the bottom part of your screen and you'll see an icon for Q&A. You just need to click on that icon and you'll have a new window open up that'll allow you to type in a question and hit send. We'll see that question on our end None of the other um, people participating in the webinar will see that question. And uh, when we come to the period of time in the presentation where we can start answering some of the questions, we'll just go through that list uh, in the order that they were received. Uh, if we're not able to answer all of the questions in the time that we've allotted today for the webinar, we're gonna be uh, available to take questions in in writing by email and be able to send you a response that way. And so if you have a question, uh, that we don't get to today, please email that to us. <clears throat> uh, attention to Heather Young here at CSNI. And Heather's email is hyoung, H-Y-O-U-N-G, at csni.org. And we'll repeat that information at the end of the webinar today for anybody who still has a question that's not answered. Uh, lastly, I wanted to um, just let you know that we will be sending everybody who registered a brief survey after the webinar and we ask that you give us feedback on today's webinar and also submit ideas for future content that you'd like to see by completing the survey, uh, which will be a SurveyMonkey link. So it's my pleasure uh, to in introduce our presenters today. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say a quick thank you to Heather for all of her work in coordinating uh, today's presentation. And um, just you know, for all of you who, know, who don't know, uh, Heather is our Director of Education and Advocacy, and a big part of what we do here at CSNI is try to provide information that's useful to families through our network of the area agencies um, so that uh, you know, families have current information on topics that are relevant to their needs mm -hmm. and can advocate on behalf of their loved ones, um, whether it's in the legislature or for uh, benefits, et cetera. Our presenters today, as I mentioned, are uh, Ann Butenhoff and Judith Bombster. They are uh, estate planning and elder law and disability law specialists located in Manchester, New Hampshire. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn the computer and the microphone over to the two of them so they can um, share their information today. Okay, so, um my voice is Ann Butenhoff. And this is Judith Bombster. And we're going to be uh, toggling back and forth um, so that we can cover the, these slides. Um, it's hard to, you can't cover everything about estate planning in a little bit. So we're calling this Estate Planning 101. It's really some basic information. Um, and what, you know, what is estate planning? It, it is a way of planning for your own disability or incapacity, as well as um, what will happen upon your death. You wanna make your wishes known for both uh, disability and death. 
Um, you want to be planning for financial security for family members and addressing the continuity of care for loved ones with special needs through advanced planning. We are not going to be talking about special needs trust today, but we will be hoping to do a, a separate webinar on that. So this is really the first in a series of webinars uh, to bring you um, good information. So again, you know, you'll be thinking about um, the importance of planning for your own financial and medical needs as well as upon your death. And there are obviously unique challenges when there's an individual with disabilities um, involved. So the basic estate planning documents that you really want to have in place are a financial power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney with a living will declaration, um, a last will, and we might, and we're also going to be talking to you about living trust, revocable or irrevocable, um, and how that might uh, tie into a full estate plan. So powers of attorney. The concept of an advanced directive, you'll see this term advanced directive on number of sites and um, documents is that you are deciding now in advance of a situation later what your wishes are. That's the, that's the concept of an advanced directive. You're going to be directing somebody um, in the future. And again, we have financial and healthcare powers of attorney. Now the purpose of a power of attorney document is that you are going to be signing a document as you're going to be known as a principal and you're going to be authorizing someone else known as an attorney in fact or agent to make decisions for you. So the principal signs the document appointing an agent or attorney in effect to make decisions later. Um, you have to have mental capacity to sign one of these documents. Um, so it's, it can't be signed by everybody. Um, and mental capacity is generally determined by the lawyer drafting the document and assessing whether the person understands the document in front of them. Um, <clears throat> there's not one particular test um, for doing this, but it's, it's a grave concern to the person who's drafting the document to make sure that the individual understands it and has the mental capacity to understand it. They're also revocable, um, as, again, as long as the principal has the mental capacity to do so. The, uh, the authority of the person being named, the agent or the attorney in fact, is going to be controlled by whatever is in that document. Um, so how that document is written is going to determine whether they can take a particular action, make a particular decision. Um, if you're over the age of 18 and have the mental capacity, uh, you should be executing this kind of a document. So uh, Jonathan, I'm turning it over to Judith and I know you had something to say. Great. Yep. So uh, for anybody who's joined us late, uh, just wanted to point out that if you have a question during the webinar, um, the, the, um, the way to get that question to us is to hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and you'll see the Q&A icon. If you click on that, all you have to do then is it'll open a window for you. You can type your question in and send it to us and we will try to um, get all the questions answered at the end of the presentation. Thanks. We normally do this in person so we can read people's faces and figure out whether <laughs> we've lost somebody or not. And uh, this is the first time that we've done it this way. So it's right. a little challenging. So this is, this is Judith. Um, I'm gonna pick up a little bit for a deeper dive on um, the types of the advanced directives. And the first one uh, we wanted to talk about was a financial power of attorney. And as Anne had mentioned, um, effectively the purpose of this document is to authorize a trusted individual 
could be a family member, could be a friend, could be a, an advisor that you trust, to stand in your shoes for financial matters, to do the things that you personally can do relating to finances. And this is a private document. This is an, something that you can, as Anne had said, you can define the scope of what this person can and can't do in the document itself. And when it comes to finances, you know, we have a couple of the items listed on the slides. Um, you know, we take things for granted every day about, you know, signing contracts, paying bills, whether it's online or by checks, talking to financial institutions to manage a retirement account or a bank account or an insurance policy, uh, processing paperwork with any of the public benefits agencies if someone is receiving supplemental security income or Medicaid, just being able to talk about those financial benefits. Um, if you can't do it yourself, your agent under the power of attorney can. So um, we wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, some definitions just so that we're all on the same page and we'll be doing that um, throughout as we talk about the different documents. But um, financial powers of attorney come in a couple of different shapes and sizes. And there's some tiny print on one of our slides, um, and it's, that's- uh, It's supposed to be big. <laughs> it's supposed to be big. It printed out large when we printed it, but the font is a little, uh, it's small, so we'll get out our glasses. Um, we have limited or general powers of attorney. You may have heard the term, is it a durable power of attorney or not durable? and springing or an immediate power of attorney. So first I wanna talk about the difference between a limited and a general power of attorney. And you know, the person who's creating the power of attorney, the principal gets to define, as Anne had mentioned, the scope of that power of attorney, whether it's gonna be narrow and limited or whether it's gonna be really broad and cover a lot of different powers, giving that agent the authority to do a broad scope of financial um, affairs. So um, a general power of attorney is very common in an estate planning practice. And that's because we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know what the agent is gonna need to do at the time they actually have to act. So if you write in a, in a power of attorney and give them all of the general powers to handle your finances that you personally can do, then they're able to step into your shoes if the time comes, if you become incapacitated and, and not have any limitations on their authority, just like you wouldn't have any limitations on your authority. You know, there are some clients that, you know, we've only done a handful of, of limited powers of attorney in my practice, and it's usually for a very specific purpose. So I know um, we've had some clients who are snowbirds, not uncommon in New Hampshire. So if someone own, moves down to Florida, but all of a sudden their house, which has been on the market forever, is going to sell and they want a child to sell that house for them, they may sign a limited power of attorney that says, yes, you can go to the closing for me and take care of that particular business. Um, you know, so a limited power of attorney is not to have someone step in as an agent to handle everything that you could do, but just for a very discreet purpose. So for instance, if you're going out of uh, the country as well for a period of time and you need someone to pay bills for you, you can write a limited power of attorney allowing that person to, to do this discreet task but not go into your retirement account and change the beneficiaries. So that, you know, that's the concept between limited and general. Right, right, good point. The next definition we wanted to unpack was a durable power of attorney versus a non-durable power of attorney. And Anne had mentioned that really the purpose of these documents is to have someone who can step in and handle things if you became incapacitated. Uh, a durable power of attorney means that your agent's authority doesn't stop and they don't have to go to a court and get permission to handle your finances just because you became incapacitated. In years past, and I'm going back to like the 1800s, there it used to only be non-durable powers, which means that an agent could only act if they were taking direction from the principal who gave them the authority. Um, but many of the powers of attorney in estate planning now are durable because the real purpose is to have someone step in if something goes wrong um, to handle those finances. The next um, set of definitions um, is a springing versus an immediate power of attorney. And I, you know, I, I sort of describe um, the difference this way to clients. Um, 
So an immediate power of attorney is exactly what it sounds like. The moment the client comes in the door and signs that power of attorney, the agents, whoever they name, and we often do a separate power of attorney for each agent, that agent has authority immediately to handle your financial affairs without question. That's an incredibly powerful document. It should be kept under lock and key in a safe place. Some folks have a, a safe deposit box, other folks have safes at home, some folks have those fireproof briefcases that are hidden under a bed, sort of like me, not your, the best your plan. Your freezer. <laughs> your freezer. It's amazing where people keep their important documents. <laughs> um, but an immediate power of attorney is easier for an agent to use if they're in possession of it because the agent doesn't have to prove to the financial institution that they're talking to that you've lost capacity. They had power immediately, you gave it to them. You just didn't want them to use it so they didn't have it in hand until they actually had to act. A springing power of attorney, the agent's authority doesn't spring into being unless the agent is determined, I mean the principal is determined to be incapacitated. So a document like that, a springing power of attorney, has a built-in condition right in it. It says, my agent can act for me if I'm incapacitated. Well, as, it, as determined by a doctor as, or two doctors. Exactly. Yep. It's going to have a medical professional who's going to determine that incapacity rather than a legal professional determining, do you have capacity to even sign the document in the first instance? But a springing power of attorney is a little harder for an agent to use. Not that it's a bad thing, because it I have some clients who prefer that level of protection. It just means that when an agent walks around with the power of attorney, the first time they work with a financial institution, they're gonna to have to bring some medical evidence with them, showing that you're incapacitated. And some people prefer not to have their medical information out in a financial arena, and others prefer to have a springing power because they like that added layer of protection on the agent's acting. Just a couple of additional considerations. Um, Anne had mentioned this already, that a financial power of attorney can be changed during the course of your lifetime, and they often are updated. Um, choosing that, as long as you have the capacity to understand the document that you're signing at the time. And, and they should be updated. You know, just because you signed documents 10 years ago does not mean you don't do them again, you know. Once a decade is not too much, you know, and really every five years, the law changes, life changes, you yeah. may have someone different in mind. Yeah, yeah, or someone, you know, a child that you might not have wanted to name because they were in, in school at 23 may have, you know, come into their own and are really ready and have a good head on their shoulders and they might be a trusted advisor to serve as your agent. Call it just sort of dusting off the estate planning documents that have been sitting in that safe place. Choosing the, a right agent, and you're gonna you know, hear us talk about that, whether it's an agent, whether it's an executor, whether it's a trustee under a revocable trust as we move along in this discussion, it's choosing someone based on their skill set. Um, you know, someone who might be excellent with managing money might not be great as being a bulldog with doctors to get an answer about medical decisions. So I have some clients who you know, want to choose people in the order in which they were born. And that seems very orderly and linear, but it might not be the best selection. So we talk a lot about who is the best person for this particular job. Yeah, what, what is the skill set? Exactly. And then having alternate agents because life's uncertain. And so we like to work with clients to, to the extent they can sort of, you know, have a nice bench of, of successor agents because these are good during the course of your lifetime and something could happen in the life of the agent that you initially name, and you want to have some people as backups who could seamlessly step in, so nobody has to go to court to file for guardianship over you to handle finances if you had just sort of thought about naming a backup. So it's really nice to have that, that person on the, on the bench. Um, and then as, a, as the slide mentions, um, you know, your power of attorney, you're going to be able to privately define in advance how much authority your agent has over your finances. And typically a general power of attorney is gonna talk about using the money for you and being able to do all of the things that you can do, but also probably using the money for a spouse, minor children or dependent children. But typically your agent has to use your money for you unless you say they can make gifts of your money, use it for someone other than you that you don't have a legal obligation to support like a minor child. So if, um, if gifts are anticipated, or if you want to be able to say, 
set aside assets for a child with disabilities or special needs that's a gift to a trust for a child, like a special needs trust, and your power of attorney would need to authorize your agent to take money out of your own name and make a gift of that so, type. So again, this is at a period of time where you lack mental capacity yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, if you want to do this while you're fine, you know, you're making these decisions about gifts. Absolutely. But again, this is when you can't make these decisions. So we like to anticipate the, wor we call the worst case scenario and plan for it so that your agent has enough options to do all the things that you could do if you wanted to. But if you have, if you ever have any concerns about uh, a nursing home admission or about um, being able to um, fund a trust for a child with disabilities, you need to be talking to your attorney about gifting language. Absolutely. So that's an important, important thing. Okay. <laughs> Just a, just a brief pause to uh, remind folks, and in case you've joined us late, you are on the CSNI webinar on planning for your child's future. And uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit as we go through the presentation, please just um, use your mouse to hover over the bottom part of your screen, click on the Q&A icon, and then you can type a question in and send it to us. And we'll try to get to all the questions uh, before the end of the webinar today. Thanks. We're going to switch gears and uh, talk about powers of attorney for healthcare. So your, you know, your world is kind of split into financial matters and healthcare matters, at least in terms of um, this type of planning. So a financial power of attorney document cannot allow someone to make a medical decision for you. You need a separate document for that, and New Hampshire has a a statutory form that's used. Um, like any power of attorney document, the principal is naming an agent to make a decision in the future. Um, these by definition are springing powers. So as Judith was saying, um, these cannot go into effect immediately. Um, you have mental capacity to, to sign this document. You are choosing people to make decisions for you in the future. But as long as you have mental capacity, you're in charge, you're making decisions. You can obviously involve children, friends in, in the room and talking to the doctor. But if somebody else is going to be making a decision, there has to be a finding that you lack mental capacity. So a physician actually activates this document by making a certification in your medical record. Um, while you have mental capacity, you can change it. Um, it's not really amendable as much as you sign a new document. Um, and these forms have changed over time. So we, we like people to sign you know, the current form because there have been some uh, new questions added by the legislature at different times. So this particular document um, has a series of questions to ask that address particular scenarios, um, but it's also intended to cover any possible medical decision. You can't anticipate everything um, that might arise. Um, there are times where an individual loses mental capacity but they're going to regain it later. A good example is a, is a stroke. Oftentimes people will you know, just get completely better after a stroke, but they, for a period of time, they, they can't make a decision. And so the doctor will put that into effect and the agent will start making decisions. But when, you, when the person gets better, then they're now the decision maker again. So these are meant to be activated and deactivated and activated and deactivated. Um, these documents are really important because um, in New Hampshire, uh, no one can make a, a healthcare decision for you over a long period of time without a court order if you don't have this document. So we do have what's known as a surrogacy law uh, that says that if you don't have one of these documents, there's a certain list of people who will be able to step in and 
serve for you. They'll be your surrogate, but it's a maximum of 90 days. And during that period of time, they need to get to court to become a guardian. So I mentioned that there were specific questions. Um, so one decision that you are addressing in this document is, are you going to give someone the authority to stop life-sustaining treatment? if you are near death or permanently unconscious. So uh, this would be a time where doctors have certified that somebody has a condition that they are actively dying from. So you're near death. Would you want someone to be able to stop life support at that time or not? Do you want life support continued no matter what? So you have a choice on the document. The other is permanent unconsciousness and the statute defines what permanent unconsciousness is, but essentially there's not brain activity and doctors have to have made this determine, at least one doctor and either an advanced practice registered nurse or another doctor have to be certified that. Under that circumstance, this is a specific question, do you want someone to be able to uh, withhold or stop life support? Now, what, what's important about this is that this is about authority. Is an agent authorized to stop life support or not? It's not a directive. It's not saying, if I'm near death, you must stop life support. It's, it's just authority. So your agent might want to get two or three medical opinions before um, deciding to withhold life support. But if they don't have that authority, they cannot stop life support. But it doesn't direct a particular outcome. So again, you know, what does this document say? How has the individual answered those questions? Um, someone's authority is going to be controlled by whatever the document says. Um, just as with a financial power of attorney, you don't want to name just one person. You want to name alternates and successors. And, um, you know, one example that I have is that when my husband's parents moved to New Hampshire, they, they relied on this printed form that only had room for two people. So they named each other and then their oldest son. My husband happened to be the middle son and he's in New Hampshire and both of these kids travel and they're either you know, available or not available. So my advice to them was, you should really be having a form that names each other and then one kid and then another kid and they happen to have a third kid. So you, you can name them in an order of succession but um, you, you wanna be thinking about those things. We have a specific uh, question in New Hampshire that's uh, in our form that's designed for a situation where someone um, is determined to lack mental capacity, but they're not near death, they're not permanently unconscious, they just have dementia or a head injury and they really shouldn't be making their own decisions. This talks about can my agent give treatment to me over my objection? So if you've ever known anyone that has Alzheimer's disease, they may become obstinate and they may refuse to see the doctor, um, go to the hospital and get um, you know, treatment. So this is designed to address that situation. Are you gonna give your agent that authority to do that? Um, under this document, the agent can never um, admit you to a state, you know, the New Hampshire State Hospital, mental hospital, or consent to sterilization. Um, a living will um, is actually the second part of the durable power of attorney for health care. It's, it's no longer a separate document in New Hampshire. Um, this doesn't give any authority to an agent. As long as you have an agent, they're going to be controlling the decisions. But what if you have nobody, nobody in place at all? This is a way for you to uh, tell doctors in advance that you don't want to be kept alive on medically administered food and water. It's a very limited question. Medically administered food and water if you're near death or uh, permanently unconscious. So if you're going to be signing this document, you want it to be consistent with your healthcare power of attorney document. Um, if there is a conflict, the healthcare power of attorney controls, and as long as you've got an agent, that controls.
So guardianship is a process involving petitioning, uh, filing a petition in court, asking for legal authority over someone's person or estate. Just like healthcare and financial powers of attorney, the courts look at um, a per you as having personal issues versus financial issues, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, these proceedings are, are filed in court, they're public records. Um, they can be costly, they're, they can be very stressful. Um, but if somebody doesn't have the mental capacity to sign a document, uh, you would be facing guardianship. And we, we will be doing um, a webinar just on guardianship, I believe. Um, again, avoiding guardianship, where you sign these documents in advance, <laughs> you pick enough agents, um, you don't revoke a power of attorney without execute, uh, you know, signing a new one. Um, so that's the, those are the primary points about guardianship we wanted to make today. Um, the final document I'll talk about before handing this over to Judith again um, is what's known as a declaration of final arrangements. Um, this is just making provisions for what happens when you die, who has control over your your remains. Um, <clears throat> not everyone needs a document like this, but if you have very specific wishes, um, you would like to have it written down. Um, sometimes in blended families, the children of a former ma marriage are not happy with the current spouse. If you want to make sure the spouse is the one who, you, to put it in writing so your family knows. Mm -hmm. And there can also be people that you have not spoken to in 10 years, you can specifically write them out. So that's um, something that is, is used under some circumstances. It also gives you an opportunity to say whether or not you want to be cremated or buried, or do you want your ashes brought up to, you know, right. out to the ocean? And it gives, it gives an opportunity to, to give some instructions in advance when at the time of someone passing, it can be very stressful and difficult. So it's nice to see things in print. Now, we did want to just mention too that joint ownership is a, it's, we don't think of it as an estate planning <laughs> tool, but it is a technique because it, um, if you name a joint owner on your account, then um, that person becomes the owner when you die and it's not going to follow the terms of the will. It's going to be, um, you know, who, who did you name? Um, there are drawbacks of joint ownership and I generally tell clients I, I do not recommend it. I'd rather have uh, people stepping in as an agent under a power of attorney or as a trustee, Judith will talk about trust in a minute. But if you're a joint owner, then they're gonna be exposed to that person's creditors and divorces. Um, there could be a potential probate if that person dies before you or, or at their death, what happens to that asset. Um, let's see, there could be a state tax planning, but for, um, very wealthy people, so that's normally not most people's concern. The other, I mean, I'm working on a case right now where a father put a, a son on an account and or it's like $200,000 on a very variety of accounts. So now that person owns all of those funds when the father died. There's no probate for those assets, but he's got three siblings. So the question's going to be, is that, is that child going to be splitting it equally with those three siblings? Um, and this person is going to do that, but there's no guarantee. Right. You know, so, you know, the, the parent should be deciding. Jonathan, did you want to say anything or, you know, or should we just keep going? Uh, again, just for folks who join late, if you want to submit a question, please feel free to do that. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So just uh, click on the Q&A button and send us a chat through that and we will get to everybody's questions. So we're going to shift a little bit to talk about how uh, folks plan for managing their assets to ensure that their wishes are followed after they pass away and mentioned one way which is joint ownership but it does have some significant drawbacks. Uh, the first uh, tool which is a very straightforward estate planning tool is a last will and testament. Uh, you know, powers of attorney have absolutely no meaning after someone passes away, and a last will and testament has absolutely no meaning until you die. Um, so what does a will do? Well, 
you know, the basic purpose of this is to memorialize your wishes regarding how you want your assets distributed when you die. Another in New Hampshire, the last will and testament is a spot where parents can nominate um, the individuals that they want to step in as guardians over minor children. Um, also an expression of wishes about in a last will in testament about adult child with disabilities, you know, we oftentimes weave that into last wills and testaments um, because it gives a court some information about what a parent's preferences were for their children. Wills actually have to go through a probate process. And one of the common misconceptions is that, and I hear it from clients as does Ann all the time, I have a will so I'm all set, nobody has to go to court when I die. And that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> um, what goes through a last will and testament and what gets controlled by a court process are assets that someone owns individually, not jointly, as Ann had mentioned, which will pass outside of probate, in their own name, at death without a beneficiary designation. That's what a last will and testament is gonna control um, for distribution. And the probate process in New Hampshire is not, I mean, we have some shorter versions. If there's one heir, whether it's a spouse, surviving spouse, or one child, but, but generally a probate process is a process with paperwork that has to be filed with the court, um, notifications to creditors, and the court has to give permission to your executor for certain actions. So even though you name an executor in a last will and testament, that's like putting someone's name on a ballot. They actually have to get elected. They have to get appointed by the court. Um, so if you die without a last will and testament, you're, you're deemed to have died intestate without directions on your estate. And if you die without that instruction, there actually is a method for the distribution of your estate. It's just that you don't define who gets what. There's a family tree on the books known as your heirs at law. And I think of it as the bloodline relations. Um, they'll look to see, is there a spouse living? If no, are there children living? If no, we're gonna go up to parents. And they go out to the next branch on this family tree and they so look nice. for a piece of fruit and that's the person who gets it. And this is sort of how you know someone inherits money from great aunt Jenny that they never met because they are the last surviving heir at law. And aunt Jenny didn't do her planning. So we wanted to talk a little bit about trusts and there are, there are different types of trusts. There's irrevocable trusts. Um, we're not gonna be focusing on those and we'd be happy to do sort of a, a weave in how do, how do irrevocable trusts play into long-term care planning or disability planning. But because this was estate planning 101, we really sort of wanted to focus on a revocable trust, which really is a will substitute. It takes the place of a last will and testament. And the goal of the revocable trust, one that you can change over time during the course of your lifetime, as long as you have the capacity to do so, is to consolidate your assets in one place and to avoid the probate court process, which can be up to a year or longer in the state of New Hampshire. Um, a revocable trust is not offering the individual who creates it creditor protection. And so I wanna talk about a couple of definitions as to why that is. Because a revocable trust is a trust that the person who creates it still owns. So they are the grantor of the trust, and that just means that they're creating the trust. They're setting the terms. They have the ability to amend that trust and tinker with it over time as their wishes evolve. They're also the trustee of the trust, and the trustee is, is technically on the books the legal owner of the assets that are in that trust. And the person who creates a revocable trust typically is the beneficiary of the trust. And the beneficiary is the person who gets to use the trust assets to really enjoy what's in there. If there's a bank account in there, they're gonna be able to benefit from the account. If there's a home in there, they're gonna be able to live in that house. And so they still own the assets, and as our slide said, they're just wearing a different hat at the time that they own it. And a revocable trust, because the grantor and the trustee and the beneficiary are typically the same individual, the IRS looks right through a revocable trust and sees the person who created it at the other end and uses their social security number. So it's, it's sort of a legal fiction. You never want to hear a lawyer say that. 
but that's what it is, and the purpose is to avoid probate and consolidate your plan. So there are joint versus individual trusts. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory. A, a joint plan um, could be used by two people creating it, the same two people being the trustees. Um, spouses often create joint plans, long-term marriages for people who have common goals, um, even blended families, if they trust each other 100% and not, don't think the surviving spouse is going to turn over the apple cart and change the plan afterward, coming in with a joint unified document, a unified plan, both having control during life is, is the joint trust design. An individual trust can be used for a couple of reasons. If someone has came into a marriage with a lot of wealth and they want to keep um, sort of control over where that goes when they die, they may keep that wealth in an individual trust. In years past, before the estate tax limits per person were over a lot of money, like $11 million per person, individual trusts were used for tax planning. Some of the advantages of a trust, I mean, why do people, people choose them? Well, because there's no probate court involvement. I had mentioned that um, what goes through a probate court process and what um, is captured by your last will and testaments are assets that someone owns individually when they die. But if the assets are transferred to a trustee, even if the person who created the trust is that trustee, then they're not owned by that person individually and personally. They're owned wearing a trustee hat. And because of that, when they pass away, there's a seamless transition and a successor trustee steps into that person's shoes and can follow that person's wishes as to how they want their assets distributed. So that revocable trust is gonna say very much the same things as a will would say, um, but it's going to be administered privately. And revocable trusts generally don't ever end up in court unless someone is doing something they shouldn't at the helm, right? Um, the goal of a, of a, of a advantage of a trust and a goal of a trust is that it's, it's a way to privately, as I mentioned, and efficiently manage your, the financial distribution of your assets. And, um, because you can do long-term planning under a revocable trust without court supervision, it's a really nice tool for managing assets for an individual with disabilities, a special needs child, because that trust, you can, you can set aside funds in a little pocket trust for them, and you can define how that money is gonna be used for them. And it can be managed throughout their entire lifetime because you've named a couple backup trustees to manage the money for that individual. And it never has to be under court oversight. But if you created a, a future, you know, a long-term trust for a special needs child under a will, well, that special needs child's trust is gonna be managed under court oversight for the lifetime of the child or until that money runs out. So having it in a trust allows families to sort of manage this privately um, and, and, and it, works, it works much more seamlessly for, for families and for the beneficiaries. What are some of the disadvantages of the trust? Well, the person creating the trust is actually doing some homework in advance. They're taking on the cost of setting up the trust, of putting assets into the trust, what we call funding the trust. So if someone creates a trust and they want to make sure it avoids probate, because Anna and I have both seen a whole lot of very pretty documents that don't do a darn thing because they don't avoid probate. Everything is sitting outside the trust. The trust isn't named as a beneficiary, and nobody put anything into that trust during the grantor's lifetime, the lifetime of the person who created it. And so you have to fund the trust, which means that if you own your home, you have to transfer your real estate to it. Okay. No, 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 I'm just... I jumped ahead to funding. So um, we are on the next slide on trust funding. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, I really think of, of trust planning not just as creating a document, but also helping families make sure that the assets are all pouring through this trust with one funnel so that their wishes about how the assets are managed um, are honored after they're gone. And so I mentioned some assets have to be titled in the trust. So real estate should be placed in the trust. 
uh, if there's stock or bonds or other investment accounts working with a financial advisor to change title from Judith Baumster personally to Judith Baumster as trustee of her revocable trust. On the books, I'm wearing a different hat. So it doesn't have to go through a probate process when I die. Other assets should name that trust as a beneficiary. And so assets that have beneficiary designations are not gonna go through a probate court process. They're gonna go to the individual that you name as your beneficiary. But if you have a trust and if you want your assets to flow through that funnel and have one common design, naming the trust as a beneficiary of life insurance is, is a great tool. So our, our last, our last slide is about selecting a trustee, and, and I think we've, we've mentioned this already, who you name as your fiduciary, whether it's an agent under a power of attorney, whether it's an agent under a healthcare advanced directive, whether it's your executor if all you're doing is a will, or whether it's a trustee if you're preparing a revocable trust sort of as that will substitute to avoid a court process, just choose someone that is up to the task, I guess, is my point. You know, you can, this person, they still have to do a job, even though they don't have to report to a court about it. Uh, you know, they're gonna have to get a tax identification number when the grantor dies. They're gonna have to notify beneficiaries. They're gonna have to invest assets if it's a long-term trust. So, and they have to put the interests of the beneficiaries before their own personal interests. So they have to be really a good steward for following your wishes. And then there are some corporate trustees that um, they're an option if you don't wanna uh, name a family member. Um, they do have the ability to not be a family member controlling someone else's purse strings. So it's kind of nice to have that independence of a corporate trustee sometimes if you have a long-term trust for a sibling, let's say, and you don't want another sibling as the trustee. Corporate trustees are immortal. So there's, you know, that's kind of nice. Um, you don't have to worry about having a whole lot of successors because the company is not going to, to disappear on you. Uh, but they do, have, um, they do have fees that they charge and many family members, if they're serving as a fiduciary, are gonna serve out of love and not wanna be compensated, so. So Jonathan, do we have questions? So um, while we do, thank you uh, first, um, thank you for the, the PowerPoint and slides. And we, I think we have really, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground at a very high level today. Um, there are uh, two questions, really. One is that, um, uh, one question is, can kind a of guardian, so when we talk about guardianship, and, and in our, um, you know, in the service world that we work in, uh, it's very common for people to have guardians, and sometimes guardians are parents, and sometimes they are their relatives, and sometimes they're public guardians. If, if if a person has one guardian in their life, and that guardian needs to travel out of the country, is that guardian able to assign power of attorney or temporary guardianship to another person to affect the things that they would be normally doing as a guardian? That, that's a good question, but the answer is no. There's really not a way for them to do that. Um, you would What you would be doing is filing a petition with the court to have someone step in on a temporary basis. So it would all, just like with power of attorney documents where you're defining an agent's authority, um, a guardian's authority is defined by whatever the court says. And you, you don't have the authority to just delegate as you see fit. You really have to get court authority to do that. And I, I think one solution um, to that to that issue if you have time in advance and if there's an ability to do it is we've seen folks who have have um, filed for a petition for co-guardianship so that if one leaves the country there's still two guardians over the person and there's still and, and both guardians have full authority to take care of the individual ward mm -hmm. It's just that they're sharing those duties and make decisions together. So we have had folks who come in as co-guardianships for different reasons, but I think it would be a really nice fit for the fact pattern you just described. And so in that case, a co-guardian, two, two people could have the exact same powers separately and yes. in Georgia. So yeah, you can. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. 
So, um, and, and again, you know, you're, the, a document and a court order can be written a certain way. So a document could say I'm naming two people, but they have to agree. Both have to sign a check or, or what have you. Or you can say they, they, either one of them can handle things. Um, <clears throat> with the healthcare power of attorney, if you have, you can name two people. If they disagree, the law says we go to the first name because hospitals and doctors need to know that they have somebody that can make a decision. So in theory, a court order could require people to agree. But you know, generally, if you each have um, a certificate of appointment, then you each have authority to make decisions. I can see where that could, circumstances where that could certainly get confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not, you know, or, or difficult, but, but hopefully, you know, folks that are Named as co-guardians or in communication with each other and are able to you know, sort of exactly. work things out right. and mm -hmm. um, you know, continue to, to operate in, in the person's best interest. Right. So um, I think uh, so that was really sort of the only um, content question. We're going to go to the other questions here in just a second. But I think you know one comment I wanted to make was that it's clear that there's a number of legal tools available for parents, um, particularly who have a, a child with a disability regardless of whether that child is a minor or an adult. And um, it, it sounds like it, it can also be a really complicated mix of things uh, if you're not used to this kind of work, right? So, you know, what should people do to, to start the process of kind of untangling you know, the, the path? Yeah, so I, Anne and I take a, a, an educational approach. So we spend, if, if it was, you wanted to come in and you wanted to talk about the issues that are on your mind about long-term planning for your child, um, we would unpack those during a conversation about planning. I mean, you can get a lot of information online. We have information on our website about the different types of documents. But sometimes until you sit down and have a conversation where you can express what your intentions are um, or how you might want to update documents or, or what your concerns are about long-term financial stability of your child and long-term care um, considerations and building the right team to make sure that if you're gone, everything's going to be okay, then, you know, working with, with an advisor who can help you do that just sort of focus the lens a little bit, I think, is a good starting place. And then just really identifying what is it that's keeping you up at night, right? right. What, are, what are the things? So it's, a, it's important to, to do the basic planning for yourself and your own disability. It's not just about planning for a child after your death. You, you have to remember that. Um, but for instance, housing is a, is a, big, a big concern to people. Is this, is this a situation where you, you're going to have a trust that uh, talks about um, someone having the right to live in the house with, with caregivers, and is there enough money to, to make that happen? Mm -hmm. but, but it is, you, you need to find someone that you trust to sit down with and start the conversation. And while all the documents are sort of a starting place, they all, it's, it's individual estate plans. It's family plans. So every plan really is different. So you're you're on Zoom right now for this. Mm -hmm. You don't go to legal Zoom. <laughs> you're right. To draft, no, really, there there is something called legal Zoom. You, it's not a good idea because um, you know you don't know if they know New Hampshire law for one thing, um, but they're not making it really individualized for you and talking help you talk through what your concerns are. Well, I think everybody probably heard my little my little timer <laughs> beeping there. Um, just before we end, first, I, again, I want to thank you guys so much for coming in and offering this information um, to help us kick off our webinar series. And uh, another huge thank you to Heather for um, arranging everything and taking care of the technology and getting us up and running. Um, the, the, there were a couple of folks who asked about whether or not they could get the materials uh, afterwards or whether a recording is going to be available. And just so folks know, two things. One is that, um, yes, we are going to make the materials available. They'll be on the CSNI website. Um, we've had a little bit of a hiccup because we just launched a new site this week. We're really excited about it. But in the process of launching that, there have been a few hiccups with our domain name. So we're 
Uh, if you go on to visit today and you don't see the CSNI site, just please go back again tomorrow and keep trying. It'll, it will be there. It just takes a little while to kind of get into the new um, into the new domain server. The other point I wanted to just sort of reinforce, and we probably should have covered this at the start, but um, today's presentation is not a substitute for legal advice. It doesn't constitute legal advice. And um, so anything that you've heard today that spurs some interest in learning more, we really encourage folks to reach out to an attorney to have a personal appointment. Um, and uh, because everybody's situation is unique and everybody's assets are unique. And, and, and so your plan has to be your plan and it needs to be guided by your financial advisors, advisors and a, an attorney that you've engaged uh, to do the work on your behalf. So um, again, I wanna thank you both for, for being here and uh, for- We've enjoyed it, our pleasure. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. And everybody who participated, thank you so much for your, your questions online uh, and for uh, being part of our first webinar in this series. Please continue to look for, uh, for updates on future webinars at our site, www.csni.org. Thank you.